Hello and uh, good evening uh, to the fourth week of our digital forensic short course. Yeah, so this is the last week and uh, what we plan to look at tonight is uh, uh, the exciting bit of uh, digital forensics and I would say challenging part as well. Uh, that's a mobile phone or mobile device forensics and cloud forensics. So we'll be looking at uh, uh, some acquisition procedures in mobile devices and how we deal with the social media forensics on mobile devices. Uh, we'll look at uh, some of the mobile forensics tools available uh, and uh, we'll also look at the challenges associated with the um, cloud forensics. Uh, okay, somebody is writing here, can't hear, so if Mark, you need could address these questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, uh, now before uh, we kick off uh, tonight's uh, webinar, uh, I mean, uh, okay, during this webinar, uh, as usual, I'll go through some of the slides uh, and then we'll do a hands-on exercise. Uh, I'll demonstrate uh, some data extraction and data analysis uh, tools uh, for mobile devices. Um, and, and then we'll carry on the uh, discussion in, in, during this, uh, maybe halfway, we'll have a short you know, uh, break for some you know, couple of two or three questions. Uh, before I move on to tonight's uh, uh, plan, uh, let me thank a few people who have been really engaging uh, in online and in, in posting their discussion. I mean, uh, I'll just show you uh, two, three of the sample. I mean, um, please pardon me if I don't show uh, other people who have done the great work as well. I just thought these two, three were uh, really uh, you know, very, very visible in terms of uh, the level of discussion initiated in these. I mean, this is the post by Anthony Troy, who has uh, shared his experience um, from a school where he was working and how he handled uh, a case where a student who stolen uh, a teacher's USB and uh, phone username and password, and he was trying to harass uh, teachers and students. So this great uh, story. Anthony, thank you. Uh, another example is uh, by Darren Miller. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, how he has tackled uh, all the three uh, projects, five, six, as well as seven. So that's great, and and, and people responded uh, to these, you know, very thorough posts, especially on uh, Project 7, so great to see that people really uh, involved and, and thinking uh, on how to tackle uh, these scenarios. So well done, uh, Darren, and people have uh, responded to that post as well. Um, another example is here from uh, Vishka Piris, uh, his approach to uh, uh, project 7, uh, also a great example uh, of, you know, uh, how to handle that, uh, uh, that the case and what tools to use, and the people responded to, to that post really well and, and uh, good uh, responses to, to the original post and, uh, and, and which has response to people's uh, posts. Well, great work, guys, uh, and I said that there are many similar examples like that, but due to time um, shortage, I can't uh, show everything, uh, but I'm a great work, uh, work people, uh, well done, and, and those people who I couldn't show well, thank you for uh, actually participating in the discussion forum and having the uh, discussion uh, going and engaging people. Well done. Okay, uh, now tonight, this is our last uh, uh, webinar, uh, and uh, we'll look at, I mean, the slides are around 40, 45, but I'll just show a few of these and, and focus more on hands-on stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and, and and the slides. I mean, you can you can read through and some of the stuff you can Google and and uh, have uh, find some supporting material to read on that. Okay, starting with the, some basics. I mean, we tend to store a wealth of information on mobile phones and smart devices these days. And uh, if you think closely, uh, I mean, smartphones have basically taken over many other devices. I mean, we no longer use digital cameras. We hardly use uh, wristwatches. Um, uh, we hardly use um, thumb drives or, yeah, because we get all these services from our modern days mobile phones, there's, a, there's heaps of storage, uh, I mean, and, and, and the, 
the cameras attached with the mobile phone or built in the mobile phone they are you know up to 16 or 20 megapixels much better than many of the um, digital cameras available um, yeah and uh, we don't need navigators anymore it's built in our mobile phone yeah so we tend to use mobile phone as multi device multi devices into one and uh, and that basically uh, i mean helpful as well, i mean it's probably the convenience of having uh, many sources at one device at the same time it's a single point of weakness that if this mobile phone mobile device goes into wrong people hand they will have um, so those people will have access to heaps of information the videos the audios uh, your GPS locations contacts mails access to your clouds data uh, yeah yeah so that's why it is very important to understand the forensic process uh, and, and these days uh, forensic investigators they tend to handle uh, the Come, to, come across with more cases which deal with the mobile devices as compared to dealing with a, a fixed storage media. I mean, here are some of the examples uh, that what sort of uh, data is stored uh, on mobile phones. Okay, your your voice calls data, not just voice, so many video calls data as well, uh, the MMS and messages, uh, email accounts, instant messaging logs, web pages, pictures, videos, music files. You can think more, calendars, uh, address books, uh, social media accounts, access to your all, uh, WhatsApp, Line, Viber, you know, GPS data, and uh, voice recording and voice mails. Uh, now remember, uh, a search warrant would be needed to examine a mobile devices. If a mobile phone is seized, not necessarily every, everything in that mobile phone should be examined unless there's an explicit search warrant which tells, uh, which, which states explicitly that what area uh, to be examined. Uh, I mean, that, that is the procedure I'm talking about. I mean, how, uh, depending on jurisdiction, how law enforcement authorities they deal or they follow the procedure, that's a different discussion. Uh, now, with a mobile phone, yes, uh, we, we, we face lots of challenges. Uh, why? Number one, because there's no set standard for mobile phone, how the mobile phone store messages. Every uh, every mobile phone uh, developer, designer, they have their own uh, proprietary formats of storing data uh, and, um, and, and providing access to that. So that's one major challenge. Second is uh, every day new development in the mobile phone. I mean, if you more practically, almost every few months, you see a new mobile phone coming in the market, and uh, sometimes you hardly see they are compatible with the with the previous model. So, yeah, so getting the knowledge and developing the tools and understanding and learning the tools to deal with this uh, continuously evolving uh, and and developing area is another major challenge. Okay, uh, let's have a look at a bit of uh, technical side. So. What is inside a mobile phone and where data is stored? Uh, okay, the system data is stored in EEPROM, erasable programmable read only memory. And I say erasable, yes, it can be rewritten. Uh, why it can be rewritten? Because it helps uh, the service providers to reprogram the phones um, without having to physically access the memory chip. So remotely reprogramming the phone or resetting the phone. And often operating system is stored in ROM, in, in the read-only memory. Uh, uh, I mean, you can have a look at uh, the one. I mean, uh, more more closely uh, by understanding the how ROM works. Um, okay. Now, what is inside mobile uh, devices? I will not talk much about the PDAs, but we don't use PDAs anymore, uh, with exception to medical and industrial uh, usage. Uh, uh, PDAs have been taken over by iPods, uh, iPads, and, and uh, tablets. So, but it's good to know, like in, in case if you come across with a uh, with a uh, industry PDA, so what to access and what to look for. So here, here are the peripheral cards which are used in a PDA, your compact flash or multimedia cards or secure digital, we call that uh, SD card, in, which, which was very popular at one state. And inside a mobile device, 
Okay, the first thing to look at is SIM cards, which is found in most commonly uh, uh, mobile service, which is a GSM, uh, which has got a microprocessor and um, an and internal memory. Uh, SIM cards are similar to standard memory cards, except the connectors are aligned differently. Uh, iPhones and, and many Android phones have micro SIM and nano SIM slots. Uh, however, some can be accessed only if the phone has been unlocked. Uh, and, and GSM refers to the mobile phones as mobile stations, uh, which divides a station into two parts, the SIM card and the mobile equipment, we call that ME, which is the remainder of the phone. So the SIM card is necessary for the ME to work and serves the additional purposes such as identifying the subscriber to the network, storing service related information, and this can also help in backing up the device. Uh, and we said that SIM cards of, of um, the common several sizes uh, and, and different look and shape. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and and some phones they include the SD card for external storage as well, um, and and can provide many gigabytes of uh, additional uh, storage capability. Now uh, the acquisition procedures with a mobile phone uh, need to be looked at depending on uh, what type of mobile phone we are using or we are uh, examining. Uh, the main concern is, uh, is a loss of power. Uh, I mean, battery has a limited life. So, I mean, loss of power, uh, synchronization with the cloud services, and remote wiping. So these are three major challenges uh, when we are acquiring uh, a mobile data. I mean, what if the battery was really low when you acquired and when you started uh, to extract uh, uh, the data from a mobile phone and, and you lost the battery? Uh, what if uh, the mobile phone is, um, is, is synced with the cloud services and, and the data is stored in the cloud? And what if the user or suspect has uh, activated remote wiping and, and before you even uh, extract that up, uh, everything is gone? Yes, yeah, so because this is a volatile memory, uh, we need to make sure they don't lose power before you can retrieve the RAM data. Uh, and mobile device attached to a PC via a USB cable should be disconnected uh, from the PC to help prevent synchronization that might occur uh, automatically and overwrite data. Um, now depending on what you've been asked to do and or what has been allowed, what has been authorized to a warrant or subpoena, uh, or the, ti the time of seizure is very important. Uh, take an example that uh, uh, you seize the mobile uh, and mobile remains switched on, even if not switched on, but still um, the, the calls incoming, somebody calling in or somebody sending the text messages. So that that are after the seizure time, uh, you need to look at that whether that is relevant to the case you're dealing with or not. So uh, isolating the device from incoming signal is one technique to handle this problem. Uh, and here are a few methods of how you can isolate a phone, uh, putting the device in a, in a flight mode uh, or placing the device in a paint can. Um, uh, or using a Faraday cage uh, or using a carbon wireless stronghold bag. There are uh, specialized bags which come with, if you place the mobile phone in those bags, uh, they cut the signal or switching the device off. Uh, okay, now the drawback of using these isolating techniques is that the battery will drain faster. Uh, and uh, here are SANS recommendations um, on uh, dealing with our mobile devices. If it's unlocked, uh, it's switched on and unlocked, we need to isolate it from the network and disable the screen lock uh, and remove the passcode. Uh, if it's locked, you're looking at, uh, um, depending on, on the type of device, uh, you'll be looking at how to deal with how to uh, unlock it. And if the device is switched off, you'll be looking at uh, uh, having a static acquisition and then turning the device on. Okay, uh, now these are the areas you want to examine when you when you seize a mobile phone and, uh, and, and when you are in a, in a forensic lab. 
examining the internal memory, SIM card, um, any external removable uh, cards, and then the network provider data. Now, uh, before you access, uh, before you try to look at network provider data, you need to look at whether the search warrant authorizes you to do that or not. Yes, it's a new complication because backups might be stored on a service providers or carriers uh, uh, servers. Uh, now, the information which can be retrieved into, falls into these categories. First is service related data, which identifies uh, uh, um, the SIM card and the subscriber call data, so, um, here comes all your you know, uh, calls made, received, missed, uh, message information, and, and then the GPS location information. So if the power has been lost, pins or other access codes might be required uh, to view the files. Okay, uh, now in terms of equipment, uh, yes, uh, I mean, yes, there is some equipment available, uh, but I mean, as I mentioned earlier, that mobile forensic is uh, forensic is an evolving size. Uh, I mean, if you have an equipment which is working today very well, may not be working well on a different model which comes tomorrow. So this gives you uh, uh, looking at uh, your procedures for working with mobile forensic software and specific tools. Uh, and, and, and the first step would be identifying the mobile device, uh, its model, its makes. Uh, most users don't alter their devices, uh, and many users, they stick with the default settings. Uh, but some file, uh, I mean, some uh, file of serial numbers change the display to show the misleading data and so on. Um, and so when attempting to identify a phone, you can make use of several uh, online sources uh, such as uh, uh, phonescoop.com, uh, spelled as uh, P-H-O-N-E-S-C-O-O-P.com, that provides a whole list of a database of mobile devices, or mobileforensicscentral.com, uh, spelled as mobile, uh, uh, M-O-B-I-L-E-F-O-R-E-N-S-I-C-S-C-E-N-T-R-A-L, uh, mobilecentral.com. Yeah, so you need to make sure you have installed the mobile device forensic software, uh, and, and uh, not all facilities are equipped with the necessary software because many tools are uh, costly. Uh, some vendors offer tools that simply take pictures of screens uh, as you scroll through them, um, and, and uh, some, some vendors, they, uh, they provide limited access uh, to say private um, a forensic investigator, uh, unless you are a registered or you are working um, uh, along with a, a law enforcement authority or with a law firm uh, or with an organization who has sought the software and license for you. Yes. Yeah, so the next step would be attaching the phone to power supply and connecting the correct cables. So most phones now have a combination of USB and power cable, uh, and many are interchangeable. Uh, for older phones, you might have to look at uh, those rig cables. So if some vendors have toolkits with an array of cables. Uh, I'll show you later on um, in, in some of the um, example that uh, there's a variety of cables are provided for almost major uh, available mobile uh, devices. So once you have connected the device, uh, the next step would be start the forensic software and begin downloading the available information. And if your forensic software does not support the model you're investigating, you might need to acquire other tools. Okay? Uh, yeah, so the, the most important thing here is the software need to be forensically sound. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, we have pretty much uh, covered this one. Uh, just look at the last point here, the, the general procedure. Uh, is um, like when you have a mobile device, you remove the back panel of the device, remove the battery, remove the SIM card from the holder, and then insert the SIM card into a card reader, which is provided by your uh, forensic tool. Uh, uh, for example, XRY or Celebrat, you fed they have their own uh, card readers, so 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 you need to insert that card reader in the, into those and then connect with your uh, uh, computer. Um, um, initiate the software and that will extract that. So we'll have one exercise 
in the next few minutes. Uh, we have uh, very much talked about the first two points. Um, the last one, mo mobile forensics tools. Uh, yes, you can use access that are FTK major, since this is a free um, and open source tool. Uh, Mac lockpick, have a look at that uh, uh, and see if you can access the demo version. Uh, here are some guidelines uh, by NIST, the National Institute of Standard uh, uh, and Technologies, uh, says that uh, uh, you can have either manual extraction, we or sometimes refer as a physical extraction, uh, logical extraction. Uh, I mean the software, most of the software, they are capable of doing the physical and uh, dumping everything from the mobile phone to a storage device, uh, or logical extraction where uh, you want to specify that you want to only collect uh, certain, say, only say uh, the calls that are, or say images, or uh, or audio or video files, or hex dumping, or JTAG uh, extraction chip off in case the mobile phone was damaged. So you're looking at uh, uh, reading uh, the chips through special. Uh, specialized devices or micro read uh, looking at again uh, I mean if the device is not uh, uh, readable through um, normal either sim card readers or uh, or mobile device readers now paraben software uh, offers some tools uh, for device scissors uh, used to acquire data from different uh, phone models uh, and, and the toolbox uh, I mean device uh, Caesar contains assorted cables and SIM card reader and other equipment and, and then you can also have uh, bit BitPAM, uh, which is used to view data on many CDMA phones. So if you are in, in, in North American states, uh, and the Celebrite, as we mentioned earlier, UFED forensic system works on smartphones as well, uh, P, uh, PDAs, tablets, uh, and GPS devices. You can also have a look at mobile edit forensic, which contains built-in write blocker. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it'll be interesting that uh, um, most of, uh, I would say, the Facebook users these days, they access their accounts via mobile devices, so, so that can access, it gives you access to the Facebook data as well. Uh, so uh, once you're following standard procedures and uh, doing a logical uh, acquisition followed by a physical acquisition, you can, you can, you can collect uh, some really uh, solid uh, evidence uh, which can help you build a case. Okay. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, that uh, Celebrite and XRY are often used by law, law enforcement. Uh, normally, they're used uh, uh, interchangeably. Uh, I mean, in, in some areas, you, uh, Celebrite, you fed is uh, is good. In other areas, XRY. Yeah. So, so what we'll do is uh, let's have a short uh, uh, exercise of uh, collecting. Uh, uh, acquiring an image using XRY. Now, I won't be able to turn on the video cam, uh, but I'll share the screen uh, to show you uh, how we can extract data using uh, XRY. Okay, uh, all right, so before we move on to the cloud, all right, so what I'll do, okay, let me minimize the PowerPoint. Okay, here's my XRY install. So, now I'll be doing a logical uh, extraction from my iPad. Okay, so let's uh, start XRY. Okay, in fact, uh, uh, this evening, if you look this side, uh, I have basically uh, uh, acquired a logical uh, image of my iPad, but uh, uh, for the sake of um, uh, understanding, uh, we'll do it again. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, okay, no, I didn't mean to do that. So, okay, uh, let's go back again. I should actually uh, close that and uh, restart it. What I wanted to show you is, uh, uh, is the XRY device manual. Remember the, uh, when we were talking about the steps to acquire data, uh, the, step, uh, the first step was uh, understand what the device is. Uh, so XRY uh, device manual uh, can provide you information that what it is capable of. So if you look at uh, on the left hand side on this window, it tells you, uh, it shows the all possible uh, models available in terms of apps, in terms of devices, uh, 
So uh, when I think of a device, okay, uh, many people would be thinking of uh, Apple iPhones, uh, perhaps iPhone 6. So let's have a look at uh, that, whether the XRY sports uh, iPhone 6 or not. So let's look for in alphabetical order Apple. So let's expand that. You can see that starting from iPad 3G onward until uh, iPhone 6 LTE and 6 Plus. So I assume this is the latest one. Let's click on that and see what I XROI can uh, expect from this this particular model. Uh, yes, how to connect this phone with XROI is using iPhone cable 2. Bluetooth is not supported. Uh, and here, see the contact seams and call seams and SMS seams are not supported, but everything else can be extracted. See uh, the contacts, calls, calendars, SMS, MMS, emails, uh, and other files. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so if you come across with the iPhone 6, all you need to do is connect with the, uh, with the cable, uh, with XRY, uh, and then, uh, and that's it. There you go, you'll be able to uh, acquire all this data. Okay, um, yeah, so you can look, look at that. Uh, if you think of uh, any other, uh, what other we can think of? Maybe perhaps uh, Samsung. See if we have Galaxy 6 here. Assuming uh, that's the latest uh, uh, model. Okay, here is Samsung. There you go. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm not a Samsung user, so you wouldn't know. Okay, Galaxy 3 is here. Uh, yeah, so if you scroll down. Okay. Yeah, so I'm assuming that that, that, that covers uh, all the latest uh, Galaxy uh, models. Okay, Galaxy 5 is here. Let's, for example, click on that. So it tells us what it sports. Uh, and, uh, okay, so I550, yeah, so, I mean, lots of data which you can collect, and here the other information tells you uh, what cable to use and uh, for physical dump, what you need, and uh, an approximate dump time. Okay, yeah, so that's the XRY manual. I mean, uh, this is uh, something you don't need license for that. Um, Try to see if you can find from msab.com uh, website the the manual itself. So we'll close that. Okay. So what I want to demonstrate here is uh, extracting data. So I want to extract data from my iPad. Uh, okay. We'll click on that, and you see it it comes up with the uh, no license detected so basically i have to now plug in my license dongle so i mean the dongle is the is the is the vital part of the xry uh, which xry sends uh, as part of the xry package so i'm connecting the dongle on my usb a okay i cancel that and hopefully it will read soon uh, Okay, so yeah, it tells me uh, the, my, my my license and uh, uh, and my expiry date since we purchased for for three years. It's, okay, so let's uh, close that. We don't need to do that. Okay, what I'll do is I'll close this and I'll click on again, extract data. Okay, it will take a few seconds. There you go. Okay, so see, I mean, it's Bluetooth. Uh, only one thing which we haven't done, which we haven't followed uh, in the procedure, is that remember uh, uh, the, the, one of the earlier steps was identifying the device by looking at the XRY manual. Since I plan to extract from iPad too, so so if you're looking at the manual, it tells you what sort of cable need to be connected. In this case, that's a, a iPhone one cable. I already have my iPad connected. Uh, through USB, so click on that, it's an Apple iPad, so basically the XRY has recognized which device is this, and, and it is, so you now it's asking me uh, what sort of uh, extraction I want, uh, logical, which is a full read, or logical with no files, yeah, so we'll go with a logical full read, uh, and asking me where I should save, okay, I'll stick with this, uh, uh, this folder, my, my work folder, Okay, and uh, if I need the uh, uh, encryption, 
I can use that uh, so that only I'll be able to uh, access that, but let's uh, skip that part at the moment. Since I have already the files asking me to replace, yes, I'll do it. Yeah, so you'll see that. Uh, trust this computer, so obviously I have to uh, tell my iPad to trust this computer, so give me a second. Okay. All right, so it's connecting. Okay, so it'll take a few seconds to uh, extract that R, so let's hold on and, uh, and and hopefully there's no error. Okay, one or more errors during the logical extraction that I may not be complete. Okay, let's see what is that. Anyway, so we, we can see that error log. Uh, but any, so what we got now is uh, this extraction. Uh, so we'll click on finish. Okay, so we can look at the log, uh, but we'll, we'll skip that one. So close the wizard, and here it is. Okay, now this is my iPad. Okay, and and tells me okay the time of um, extraction, what XRY version I'm using. Uh, yes, there were some errors. We ignored that. Okay, let's look at the device. So here are. Uh, device general uh, information not giving me much as you I think the looks like the error was uh, I think critical so I can't see much data in here okay let me see if I can uh, okay since this was a faulty extraction. Uh, what I can do is I'll, anyway, I wanted to show you the process how to extract, which I have seen that. Uh, since I have extracted this evening, as you can see that from the timestamp. So let's open that extraction file uh, because I have more information. Hopefully it hasn't overwritten uh, the previous extraction, which looks like it has. Okay, what's in the log? Okay, 1310. So, okay, so it looks like I couldn't extract some of the information. Okay, just bear with me, please. So, the 353. Okay, all right, so let me go back, close this, and see if I can open the file from my work folder. Sorry, that was a different place. Okay, here it is. Uh, oh, sorry, it has overwritten see, uh, my evening file. So what we can do is we can try uh, a new extraction. So, yeah, okay. Okay, let's try that. Full access, cable, Apple. Okay, store. Okay, what I'll do is I'll have a different folder, perhaps, okay, I'll go into, um, okay, let me store at a different location, okay, trust this computer, okay, okay, no, we don't want this one again, so just bear with me. Yeah, I'll, I'll kill that. No, I don't want to save that. Okay, I'll save the log. Okay, and then done, close, continue. And, okay, so I'm just, okay, let's, sorry for that, so I'm now reconnecting it, 
and uh, see if this uh, AK device driver software install. AK extract data from device, yeah. The cable, iPad, full logical. AK, let's uh, okay, yeah, stick with that uh, uh, folder, yep, yeah, replace it. Now, interestingly, I'm not getting that uh, message. Let's see how we go. Something happening. Yeah, you can see that um, the section log was doing and telling, uh, like in this case, the device is not until broken, so okay, hopefully it's working. Looks better. No, successful. No, no error. So okay, yep. So we finish that. Okay, finished successfully. So we close the wizard, and there we go. So we have now, as you can see that, you can see much more uh, uh, fields over here uh, as compared to the one it was showing uh, when the extraction was erroneous. So see general information, so you can see uh, much more data here. So tell me what type of um, iPad it is, uh, its version, and uh, and state, the storage capacity available, uh, owner name, yeah, and uh, network information. There you go. So it's going to here. It's telling us uh, what network it has been connected to. So in this case, say CSU Connect 36 different uh, uh, sessions. Um, yeah, um, this might be overseas and with the whole log of uh, uh, dates and, uh, yeah, so uh, and speed rate. Um, yeah, it's a big pawn, and uh, so wherever, for example, I have connected uh, this device, it tells me uh, that history. And the event log, there you go. So you can see, uh, yeah, what process was activated, what date. Yeah, so you can see long list of um, event log uh, on this um, iPad. And here are the installed apps on, on this iPad, uh, accounts, uh, there you go. So you see that uh, uh, I have a Skype and uh, tells me what Skype uh, uh, accounts I have, WeChat, what's my uh, WeChat um, uh, login, uh, yeah, and, and contacts. So she's showing us there are 389 contacts available. And if you click on that, that will show me all the contacts on this iPad, okay? And calls. Okay, so here are the Skype calls which I made so to who, and and again the time time log. Okay, calendar. So again, 287 items. So click on that. That's to show me uh, my calendar uh, activities. So what day when you know we have something you know on. Okay, and with the description of uh, calendar messages as well. A task. Okay, if we have if we have listed any tasks, yes, they are here. Uh, notes if there are any, yeah, you can see that. Messages, yes, so it currently says there are 16 chat messages. There you go. So it seems to be all either one is Apple i uh, Apple iMessage, and the rest are uh, Skype uh, iPad messages, incoming, outcoming. Okay, status updates. Yeah, tell me here. Seems to be since a WeChat is a Chinese version of. Uh, or Chinese equivalent to WhatsApp, so that's why it shows, you know, in Chinese. Uh, location, very interesting, okay, location history, the GPS data, okay, so tell me what, like, when I access this iPad and where, okay, like, see this shows here in Melbourne, uh, this was, uh, and you can see uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you should be able to show you Google Map as well, there it is. Okay, that uh, uh, what particular day where I was, Bundaberg. Uh, this should be end of July somewhere. Okay, yeah, there you go. 
uh, searches like what searches I have done uh, using this iPad, uh, what web that I have. So the 170 uh, web history, web pages history. Uh, so here you can see uh, a suspect, you know, what sort of uh, website they have been accessing, and then and then you can uh, build up the case uh, and and creating the relationship of uh, suspect activities. Uh, yeah, so look at that. Uh, uh, bookmarks, if there are any, so you have few. Uh, what searches and and what uh, keywords I have used to search? Okay. Uh, okay, cookies. You will have a long list of cookies. Okay. Uh, and then, if there are any documents or files, so there are say 51 pictures stored on this uh, iPad. Okay. Uh, and uh, any documents, hey, there you go. So we have mostly, you know, binary plist data uh, and databases, SQLite, and if there are any unrecognized. Yeah, yeah so as you can understand that, uh, I mean, this could be very helpful uh, to, to basically build a case and see uh, uh, so you know if there was any any wrongdoing uh, by looking at some of this data. Okay, I'll close this one. Uh, and uh, do we have uh, any questions? I'm not sure if Margie is there. Uh, if we otherwise, I'll keep going since I wanted to Hi, share. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Margie, we can hear you. Oh, that's good. Sorry, um, microphone troubles earlier. Um, so I've got some questions lined up for you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start from the bottom. Uh, what process do you use to verify the data from acquisitions of mobile phones? Um, okay, uh, the verification would be obviously taking the image uh, and um, so once you have extracted a logical image, then you can have a physical extraction as well. So you can verify, you can compare the logical with the physical. Um, and then obviously you will follow the, the normal uh, uh, forensic procedure, uh, making the copy of that uh, before you're examining. Like when I was clicking, uh, since I was working on the actual extraction, I might have overwritten uh, some data. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, that, that's one way that you can verify the physical as well as logical. Uh, other way is uh, use, say, uh, two different tools to accept data. Say, as I said earlier, that uh, uh, most law enforcement, they use a, a, a combination of XRY as well as UFED. So accept data from XRY and then from UFED and, and verify that. Yeah, so again, depending on, 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 the, on the device, there are several ways to, to handle that. Okay, thanks, Margie. Um, so, some earlier, uh, Yasin asked, "Hi, can't you simply turn on airplane mode, then um, extract the data to prevent remote wiping?" Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, you can do that because with airplane mode, you will be basically cutting off the signal. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, certainly the drawback with that is that it will drain the battery faster. But uh, I mean, if you think that there's enough battery. Um, Switching off uh, to um, switching on to airplane mode will basically cut off the signal, and, and then you can accept the data. Okay. Um, uh, if mobile, if the mobile is locked, can XRY software retrieve data from? Um, well, can can XRY retrieve data from it? Yes, uh, XRY. Uh, with one uh, real life experience, I was able to break into iPhone 4, uh, the passcode. So we were able to retrieve the passcode, uh, but that's a that's a complete uh, different uh, uh, exercise, and um, the loss of uh, access to a binary and hex data is involved. Uh, but just to answer the question, yes, we can do that using XRY. Um. Wouldn't you be worried that um, malicious people might use um, tools such as XRY to gain unauthorized access to data on other people's phones? Uh, XRY does lots of checks before um, issuing a license. Um, I mean, they won't normally issue to an individual. Uh, 
they will either issue to the organizations or if there's a private investigator, they will like to see the credential of that individual uh, and then they monitor very closely who is using XRY where. Uh, for example, uh, they have issued to the CSU uh, only for teaching and training purpose. If I use this uh, this tool to extract data and, and present somewhere um, and uh, if they come to know, uh, yeah, so they can simply cancel this license. Yeah, so most of the to, uh, most of the, to, uh, the providers, the tool providers, they basically uh, do a comprehensive check before uh, issuing a license. But look again, uh, there's nothing stops basically uh, somebody uh, legitimately taking it or handing over to someone else, uh, or perhaps someone stealing uh, a legitimate license from. Uh, um, uh, um, an authorized organization or individual, uh, look, I mean, people can, I mean, they, they are, I mean, we can't basically eliminate that possibility that it won't go in wrong hand. Okay, uh, Margie, so we'll leave the rest, rest of the questions um, for maybe a written response. So if you could kindly collect those, uh, that'll be great. Uh, yep. So that's what XRY. Uh, now, given that most people would not have access to XRY, uh, I came up with another, another exercise uh, that's uh, Oxygen Forensic. Now, Oxygen Forensic provide access to demo version of Oxygen Forensic for uh, students provided student provide a proof of uh, uh, enrollment in a digital forensics related studies. So, I mean, still it is tricky for many people who are not formally studying anywhere. Uh, but I mean, if you are studying, if you enroll into security course and digital forensics is part of your course, uh, Oxygen Forensics can provide you a free access uh, to their demo version. So, yes, yeah, so it's up to you. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you happen to be studying now or in future, uh, just simply request uh, Oxygen Forensics by completing their, I think they have a, a form somewhere here on their website, and they will access you, they will give you access to uh, uh, their demo version. Now what I have done is, since I have access to Oxygen Forensic, uh, now they did, okay, they do provide some demo backup, backup as well, see? So they have provided some extraction, already extracted data from these phones. So what I got here is, uh, uh, a data from iPhone I, or, I have already downloaded from here. So what I'll do is I'll start this and okay, let me go on to Oxygen Forensics, my forensics tool. Okay, okay, I'll start to Oxygen Forensic Analyst. You see that um, the interface might be different from XRY. Uh, but you will see lots of activities quite similar. Uh, in fact, I find uh, using Oxygen Forensic more uh, easy as compared to XRY or UFID. Okay, there you go. So what I'll do is, uh, as I said earlier, that I have a few files already downloaded in my, say, this week four folders. You can see that there's iPhone 4G and BlackBerry 9520. Uh, yeah, so these are the extract uh, using Oxygen Forensics. How would we know when we go into these files, when you see uh, extension.ofb, so that refers to Oxygen Forensic. Okay, let's open one of these uh, files and examine that in there. So import file, and uh, I'll do on uh, Simon Pegg's iPhone. Okay, so do extract. It will take a few seconds. Okay, while it is extracting, uh, I'm mindful of the time, uh, and if, if people don't mind, we might go a few minutes beyond our time, uh, but again, so while it is extracting, uh, I'll run through some of the slides, uh, which are on cloud uh, forensics. I mean, we have covered pretty much what I wanted to cover for a mobile phone. I mean, mobile phone itself is a topic where you can spend a whole week uh, working on it and 
and still you will feel that you're still uh, at the novice stage of learning mobile forensic. Yeah, so uh, I mean, some of the challenges are new technologies. Uh, we discussed type two hypervisors last week. Uh, yeah, and I see that many mobile forensics, mobile devices are under development um, and um, having uh, and adding different level of complexity, uh, complexities to uh, uh, to mobile forensics. Number of devices that connect to the internet is higher than the amount of people. Um, yes, and another challenge is uh, uh, wearable computers where people have. Uh, say, um, think of Google Glasses or uh, those uh, um, devices which are capable of collecting um, body data using body sensor networks. Yes, yeah, so that's causing more challenge. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's again, it's evolving, but very, very, very exciting and uh, interesting area of uh, uh, digital friends. Okay, let's see how we're going. Yeah, still, it's extracting. Um, no, cloud forensics. I mean, as you can see that in terms of slide, we are just halfway. Uh, I'll directly take you to uh, the technical bits of cloud forensics. The basics are similar with any other uh, forensics investigation, whether you use network forensic, uh, mobile forensics, or um, simply uh, hard drive forensics. Uh, there are three dimensions with the cloud you might find different than the others. First one is looking at the organizational, which is addresses the structure of the cloud, how the cloud is set up, the legal aspects, which covers service agreements, service level agreements, and other jurisdictional matters, and the technical detail, which deals with the procedural um, issues um, and um, how to perform uh, forensic recovery and analyze the data in a cloud. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, forensics tools, uh, they need to handle first data acquisition by looking at uh, these aspects, like forensics data collection, must be able to identify, label, record, and acquire data. Remember, a cloud service provider would be uh, providing service to many clients. So uh, uh, segregating uh, data for one client from other client is very important. So when you are acquiring uh, data from clouds, so you want to set up the procedure in a way that you don't uh, go beyond uh, that particular client's data. So an elastic, static, and live forensics uh, must be able to accept expand and contract their storage capabilities uh, and as mentioned earlier that must be able to segregate uh, uh, evidence from one business to other business from one client to other client uh, and then uh, looking at how you will uh, investigate in a virtualized environment since many cloud uh, providers will be using providing uh, the virtual uh, systems uh, it's very important to understand the CSPs the cloud service providers relationship with its uh, users um, and what are CSP's obligations to the users, and how warrants and subpoena will apply to CSP's and users. And as we mentioned, service level agreements, looking at those uh, um, thin prints uh, on service level agreements, um, whether uh, a user or client can access to their data uh, from cloud service providers uh, servers if they need to recover uh, or investigate data. So jurisd jurisdictional issues are major challenges as there are no laws uh, which can cover global uh, access uh, uh, and we don't see that laws are evolving at the speed uh, at which our technologies are evolving. Uh, and you might not find um, uh, laws being uniform or, uh, in, in different regions. So investigators are concerned about cases involving uh, data commingle among uh, customers data uh, and, and that was the major challenge for a forensic investigator to demonstrate uh, when they're doing uh, a testimony in a court the data collected d does not constitute any data which was not from that uh, client. <laughs> yeah, so you can look at, uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, do search on um, the jurisdictional issues, uh, uh, take a look at a uh, European Union directive. Uh, on, uh, on privacy and jurisdictions uh, and uh, I mean you want to consult with your attorneys with your legal advisors before accessing uh, any uh, cloud forensic data before yeah so you want to look at uh, uh, the search warrants they should be specifying 
what area, what data you are uh, accessing to, uh, and description of what to be seized. Obviously, with the cloud environment, the property to be seized usually uh, describe data rather than physical hardware, unless the CSP is the suspect. Um, and this must describe the location of items to be seized, and it's difficult when dealing with the cloud data because servers are often uh, dispersed across state or national borders. Uh, yeah, so we, we need to establish how uh, the chain of custody would be uh, maintained uh, and how the, uh, the log of uh, uh, different steps would be uh, carried out. Uh, other, uh, I mean, these are some of the areas to look at, uh, search warrants and then uh, subpoena and court orders, how you can compel uh, a CSP, a uh, closed service provider, to provide access to their data and what information uh, you think uh, that they, uh, they believe to be accessible. Uh, I mean, you, you need to really make good case uh, if there was a danger of death or serious physical injury involved in a case uh, to convince a court or magistrate uh, to compel a cloud service providers to give uh, access to their servers. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I mean, these are the technical challenges uh, in cloud forensics. Uh, I mean, we can spend, uh, again, uh, several minutes on talking about uh, uh, each of these challenges. Uh, I mean, looking at the architecture, um, I mean, clouds, they vary by architecture, if you recall, um, IAS or PAS or SAS. Uh, yes, yeah, so they configured in different ways, uh, depending on the type of cloud architecture, customers data might be commingled, so making it difficult to sort through data to determine what's relevant to investigation. Uh, in terms of data collection, um, uh, I mean, analyzing Evidence collected from a cloud requires verifying the data with other data and log records. So you might need to reconstruct the data to determine what actually occurred during an incident and compare network records to make sure server's internal clocks are synchronized correctly. Uh, Anti-forensics uh, is a term uh, refer where, uh, where uh, cloud environments uh, are, uh, and, and other networks and environments, like um, and hackers might uh, um, obfuscate incriminating files or hide them by the simple technique of changing file extensions. Uh, specializing malware for defeating evidence collection can add time to an investigation and result in the loss of valuable evidence. Yeah, so basically, in simple words, destroying uh, potential evidence from a cloud is called entire forensics. Uh, and then you know, um, issues such as incident first responders, uh, like uh, uh, so if the CSPs have personnel trained to respond to a network incidents, such as system and network administrators who handle uh, the normal uh, support issues, and when a network intrusion occurs, they become first part of contact, first responder to the incident. So if a CSP does not have an internal first respondent team, uh, the forensics and examiners uh, should organize CSP staff to handle uh, these tasks. So the factors in this case would be uh, dealing with the operational staff at the CSP. So you need to know or brief the staff about the operational security issues, or you need to train staff in evidence collection. Yeah, so a whole lot of uh, uh, issues which you are dealing with uh, when the CSP does not have its own uh, system administrators, and then uh, leads on to the role uh, management, who would have what role in terms of who is the data owner, um, who is the uh, data uh, custodian or users, who has got access control, uh, who's got a list of uh, access, and then uh, obviously the legal issues and standards and training uh, of staff uh, to deal with the uh, cloud data. Uh, you can look at more uh, from Cloud Security Alliance website. Website. So just type in cloudsecurityalliance.org uh, to look at some more challenges. Okay, uh, you know, acquisition methods, I mean, depending on what type of cloud you're dealing with. So the most important thing is here, that this is this last point, you, you need to look at the, how would you be able to recreate separate cloud servers from each snapshot acquiring an image of each server and calculating the hash value. So that would be the major challenge. Uh, and the encryption in the cloud is another challenge. Um, yeah, investigating CSPs. 
uh, what sort of uh, rights or what sort of authorities you know investigator would have uh, yeah so have a look at uh, these issues uh, and then if you have to investigate uh, cloud customers uh, what area and how you will build up the evidence uh, uh, maybe by looking at web browsers or cache files or if the CSP's application is installed uh, looking at the evidence of file transfer in the application folders uh, normally they are found on the user's account folder um, now, uh, I mean the next few slides this shows you uh, some uh, techniques to deal with the Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive uh, yeah, so I'll leave it with you guys to look at those, uh, and then I'll take you to our um, uh, uh, Oxygen Forensic Extraction. And here are some of the tools which you can use to uh, for Cloud Forensics. Uh, and case again, Access Data uh, Digital Forensics Incident Response. Unfortunately, none of them uh, is uh, freely available except for uh, Pro Discovery. Uh, I think uh, Pro Discover Basic is, uh, I don't think so, the incident response and the forensics, uh, the Pro Discover version is, uh, is easily available. I mean, I mean, when I say easily, I mean it's open source. So you'll have to purchase that. Okay. All right. So let's go back to our extraction. Okay. So extraction summary success. Uh, okay. Let's open the device. Click on finish. There we go. Okay, so as you can see here, so remember it was Simon um, Page uh, iPhone 4S. So have a look at in one view what you see here. Okay, so the phone, iOS, even iMe, and uh, the version and uh, when the extraction was done. As I said earlier that this is the extraction which I have downloaded from Oxygen Forensics. And, uh, and you see that a bit of notes from the uh, uh, investigator. The device phone in a stolen car from this particular address. Uh, and a bit of more uh, uh, information like uh, Patrick's uh, younger uh, brother probably worked together with him and never called Patrick no yeah so okay look at this one the, the common section and we can expand the tree view over here okay starting with the device information okay I can see here much more information on on, on the device itself and you can see here the owner's accounts like the owner of this device, what sort of LinkedIn account he has, WhatsApp or ICQ. In some cases, you'll find password as well, if the password was stored uh, on the device. So you can see that. Okay, so that's our device information. Let's go back and, okay, we can use here, uh, okay, phone book. Okay, so with photographs of the phone contacts see that and in some cases include the address so whatever on the phone and you can see that what were the favorites on this right hand side uh, going back um, messages yes so that will give you access to all the messages on that phone and you can see that when the, they were iMessage emails um, email with attachments and clicking on one uh, would for example okay let's click on this one so yeah so you can see then the bottom in the work window here a simple text plane and and a one short message there okay uh, going back to uh, okay applications see what sort of applications are installed messengers there you go almost all sort of uh, uh, social media uh, messengers uh, take a look at line Skype WhatsApp. So if you click on line, that should show you, uh, yeah, all the people, uh, the messages were exchanged, their phone numbers, uh, and and the text here. Okay. So what, as soon as we click on uh, a particular uh, artifact, that shows us the detail uh, here in the in the work window. Okay. Uh, what else? Okay. WhatsApp mess messages. You can see that, uh, and you can read the whole text on this side as well. Uh, the most interesting thing would be looking at browsing 
history. See, see that what web browser this person has been using. So let's look at uh, Google Chrome with 148 uh, clicks. There we go. So from here you can profile a person by looking at uh, what they were doing using that device, what sort of uh, websites they were looking at, uh, and then you can um, accordingly form it, uh, I mean form the case. Okay. See, like this guy was looking at how to buy cheap iPhones or where to buy cheapest, you know. Uh, yeah, and then when we click on that, that will take you to, obviously, you know, uh, yeah, so we don't want to go in that way. Okay. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to show. Uh, you know, the last couple of slides are since this last week, and uh, next week is the final exam. Okay, and uh, the final exam, yes, so uh, the exam will be activated uh, uh, on 20th of October, next Tuesday. Uh, it will be available for one whole week, so you'll have one whole week to attempt that. There are 40 multiple choice and true false uh, questions. Uh, majority of that would be multiple choice. Uh, you'll have one hour to complete and one attempt only and I think it's only need to be completed in one session that once you start you have to complete like you can't uh, abort the test and go back because the timer will start and um, it will simply uh, take off. Yeah, so it shows you have completed the prerequisites. That's correct. Okay, thank you, Margie. Thank you for confirming that. Uh, and sure, you have completed the prerequisites to sit the exam, uh, which are the four quizzes, weekly quizzes. And as for the outlines to receive a certificate, you need to complete the weekly quizzes and complete the weekly hands-on or case activities, uh, which means to post your finding in the forum or comment on somebody else's finding. Is that correct, Margie? Like, yes. not, okay, even if you are, for example, if you were not able to uh, complete a project uh, for whatever reason, even if you have provided some, uh, some uh, sensible, some reasonable comments uh, uh, and contributed on the forum, uh, that will be considered as participating in that activity. Uh, yes, week five, uh, as I said earlier, that, that uh, the, the next week is the official certification period and the only time which you may qualify for a certificate. Um, yeah, so Morgie will send you the emails warning you about uh, when the exam will be activated or when it will be about to close. And in case of any issues, Margie is the point of contact. Thank you, Margie. Uh, the, yeah, the lesson's last slide, so good luck with the exam. Uh, and uh, if you plan to uh, go into digital forensics career, so if you have any questions about studying at CSU, uh, as we um, mentioned a couple of times, uh, the Master of Information System Security, that's a very popular course at CSU uh, and, and, and gives you lots of uh, um, skill. I mean, this short course was one third of one of the subjects which is studied in that master. So, so imagine that you will complete 12 subjects with similar level of skills and expertise and what you learned in the last four weeks was just one third uh, of uh, what you will learn in that whole master program. Yes, so uh, email address is uh, Neil. Uh, yes, yeah, so please um, keep in contact with him uh, if you need any further information on the course. Uh, and, and the interesting part is that uh, our courses recognize industry certifications. Uh, if you have already done, uh, for example, CISP or any forensics certification, talk to Neil and he will advise you whether uh, you are eligible for a credit uh, or against. Thanks, Kambir. Just a quick word, um, Neil here. Um, we have a graduate certificate now with four subjects, which we've always had, but um, due to everyone asking for it, they can be now four security subjects. You don't have to do communications with it. You don't have to do ethics. You can do just try out a master's, just do four subjects and do them all on security subjects. And that's going to be very popular. Excellent. So I'll hand back to Tambia. Yep, thank you, Neil. Yeah, so I mean, um, earlier people used to have, um, uh, I mean, some people just want to learn the Okay, mostly security. I mean, we have some other soft subjects as well in the program, as Neil mentioned, like ethics. If you don't want any of those soft uh, skill subjects, simply want hardcore uh, security skills, just choose for you know uh, security related subject. 
Yeah, so in terms of uh, if you have any questions or interest in digital forensic study or research, uh, I'll be more than happy to respond to your queries. Here's my email address. I think that's, that's also in this uh, meeting we have covered uh, mobile forensics as well as cloud. Uh, we have demonstrated use of oxygen forensics. You know, the two exercises, okay, I'll, I'll come back to that, uh, the two projects for this week. You'll be using uh, OS forensics or uh, Imager Lite. So next week, the exam, as we mentioned earlier, okay, let's come back to uh, our, our plan for this week. Okay, just bear with me. Uh, okay, let's have a look at the projects for this week. Uh, week four. Okay, here we are. Study guide is provided. Uh, slides would be available over here, or maybe they're already there. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, readings on cloud forensics. Please uh, read, uh, have a look at these uh, when you get a chance. Um, the homework. Okay, uh, project eight. So we have we have provided one. I think around six gigs of uh, uh, image, uh, I believe. Yes. So. Uh, uh, that's right, project8.zip. So download that file, please. And in project8, like here's a scenario, okay? That your company's legal department gives you a raw DD image file, if you recall from first week, we learned the file formats, and which is that project image, as we've shown in the previous uh, uh, screen. Yeah, so this is a Windows 8 computer's hard drive image used by this company's employee, Denise Robinson. So you've been asked to identify any file that might have been uploaded from Denise uh, Robinson's computer to the Dropbox cloud service. To determine whether files were uploaded, you must find the Dropbox folder where files are synced to see what it contains. Yeah, so basically you're examining that image. So follow these steps and you will use, uh, uh, I think, OS Forensics for this. Yes, OS Forensics for this. Uh, project and uh, your task is uh, once you're done uh, just write a short memo of uh, say a couple of lines I mean, you don't have to follow any any template as you guys have uh, I mean it was great to see a variety of templates uh, in the first week uh, exercises uh, but just just for the sake of uh, this exercise um, uh, I mean you don't have to follow any format just drop, drop you know a few lines uh, of your finding or, or make comment on other people's finding Okay, so that's project eight, uh, and our last project is project nine, uh, and, and that's a short case study, uh, given most people in Australia, so I thought it would be uh, useful to, to get you to know um, Australian privacy principles. So that case study is uh, uh, basically looking at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, Australian privacy principles uh, uh, website. Uh, and uh, once you go through that uh, website, just write two, three paragraphs on the forum uh, summarizing the disclosure requirements, uh, steps for storing uh, personal identifiable information data in Australia, uh, requirements for getting consent from data owners, uh, and any exceptions allowed by this law, not this law, sorry, that's a typo here. Uh, yeah, so look, I mean, given that you'll be dealing um, with the cloud uh, uh, services or cloud data, uh, having a good understanding of uh, APP principles uh, is very important uh, and give you some sort of a legal and, uh, uh, and, and guidelines on how to tackle uh, data ownerships um, in the cloud and, and privacy issues. Okay, uh, that's it. So, Margie, I mean, if there are um, uh, one or two uh, questions, we can, uh, I mean, uh, obviously burning questions, uh, we can answer that. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll do the same as we did the last three weeks, uh, uh, providing a written response. Yep, that sounds fine. Um, most of the questions today related to mobile forensics, so uh, we might wait till um, the forums to answer those questions. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel Margie. Uh, and look, uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, it was really uh, great and um, interesting. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, everyone. Uh, let me uh, give a big thank to Margie. Uh, James is not here, but Neil uh, for organizing this um, 
uh, the short course. Um, they have done a lot of work, much more work than you expect from my side. Uh, I'm setting up the whole uh, course online uh, and responding to everyone. And, and they have a lot more work to do. Maybe my work will finish over here this week. Uh, but I'm sure Margie will have next couple of weeks uh, to look at who has completed the requirements for certificate and then um, uh, sending the certificate to those people. Uh, thank you very much, Margie, for the great work. Thanks for all your fascinating webinars. Thank you. So have a good night, everyone. And uh, yeah, so keep in touch in either way to Neil or to myself. Good night or good morning, wherever you are.